Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's my very great pleasure to welcome Gregory Malika from Harvard, where he's a student of uh, Greg Morissette and of Adam Tripala at the same time, which is yeah. a very fine combination to have supervising <laughs> you. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about some uh, proof automation in COC. Thanks. All right, thanks for having me. So as, uh, as Nick said, I'm Gregory. I'm going to talk to you about proof automation in COC. Um, so you know, maybe I'm talking to a, an audience that already believes this. Formal verification is kind of a nice thing. We have lots of systems that we rely on all the time, things like cars and bitcoins and iPhones or Windows phones. And we kind of expect them to work. And we expect them to not have security problems. And we don't get this necessarily from all current software. So the rooster up there says that this talk is going to be a little bit about cock. But from what I do, I've been looking at program verification for a while. I started out looking in this um, system called Why Not using Hoare type theory. We built things like d databases and web servers. Since I started working with Adam Japala, I've started working on a system called Bedrock, which is about lo lower level program verification. And, and all these things are built on COC. And I'm going to talk to you in particular about the automation that goes into Bedrock here. So Bedrock is a language kind of think of it like assembly language programming and we want to verify large programs with it um, so things that we've verified with it are compilers garbage collectors even kind of the entire stack up, up to a simple web server accepting kind of only the POSIX um, very simple net API send and things like that the the work that I'm going to talk to you about today has been used in bedrock uh, and is being picked up by Andrew Pell using his verified software toolchain um, for, for verifying C programs, and also this charge project that Jesper Bankstrom has been working on. So all of these things kind of fit into this similar application domain of verifying imperative programs. Here's what an imperative program might look like for those of you who don't know what imperative programs look like. Imagine that's not very many of you. The simple, um, a simple finite map data structure, we're going to assume it's implemented as a linked list and we might write some code that looks up some key inside of it. Now, the code here isn't particularly important. All of you probably could have written this. The specification just says, I'm going to take in a map, um, M here, the parameter, and a, a mathematical version of that map, ST here. So you can think of that as what the map actually represents. And here I'm going to give some result that corresponds to an unchanged map plus some property about the result of this function. Now, the details aren't, aren't particularly important. What I'd like to get across to you is that in reasoning about this code, I have to reason about all these different domains. So let's take a look at one verification condition that might come up if you start running this function and you get and you, you just immediately run through here and you return at this point, return career value. So you'd start with the precondition, you'd get your sequence of instructions that are running, and you'd have to justify the postcondition. And what you'd essentially do is you'd start by unfolding this map predicate, exposing some stuff, um, the head pointer and things like that, and then you'd start symbolically executing each of these instructions, learning the assertions, moving them into the precondition, and until you finally get to the end of the, inst the instruction stream, and you just start manipulating the post condition, and then you'd try to solve this entailment. So, you know, when, when we looked at this, we had to reason about logic. We've got lots of ands. These are really stars, but uh, separation logic is not terribly important for this talk. We've got arithmetic. We're, t we're reasoning about pointers and pointer aliasing. We've got things like finite maps. We've got quantifiers, and we've got um, kind of other predicates, things like sortedness of arrays. So all of you, I think, are familiar with COC, but for anyone in the room or who's listening who isn't, automation kind of works like this. So to prove a program, we'll take a very simple program. 
Um, we'll just think about a proposition. We want to prove that P and Q entails Q and P, right? So the standard way to do this is with tactics. So you might run a bunch of tactics across, introduce the, uh, the, the P and Q fact, destruct it, split it, perform some assumptions. In cock, this builds this proof term kind of in a schematic way. And we could make it faster by, by doing something like this. But regardless, we'd still build the proof term. So the important thing is, is if I do it manu uh, if I do it completely manually, then it's a lot of work. If I do it automatically using an LTAC program, I'm still building the same proof term. I'm not getting any compressed proof term or any better proof term. I actually usually end up with a worse proof term because I've made my code more generic. So when we think about applying this type of verification to our kind of toy example up here, we realize that each one of these steps is going to result in a very large proof. We're going to have to manipulate lots of quantifiers. We're going to have to manipulate maps and various reasoning pieces. So if each one of these little things represents a, uh, a big proof, then when we compose them all together, we'll end up with big proofs. If we want to verify large programs, um, then these big proofs will start to overwhelm us. So for example, in the Bedrock project, we've been looking at proofs where you can't even kind of do them in a reasonable amount of time on an 8 gigabyte machine. And um, so thinking about things like taking 30 minutes to verify a program, a, a relatively simple program. All right. So the idea of this talk is to use this notion of computational reflection. Right? So computational reflection says, let's shortcut all these, all these little tiny steps by writing a verified procedure here. And the way, the way computational reflection works is we take our goal and we're going to try to represent it syntactically. We do this because we can't write a program that matches on terms in prop because we don't know what they are exactly. It's an extensible type. So we build, we carve out some subset of our types. Here we're just going to talk about this x here, think of that as the injection of some property. So here, p here would be injected as x sub p. The same thing with q. We have um, conjunctions and we have things like true. So very simple language. We connect this, we connect the syntactic representation to the semantic meaning using a denotation function, here prop d. And what we do is we prove that if we give a particular term to this prove function, and it returns a new term, then we prove that prove is sound. And we say that if you assume this, then you can prove this. Right? So we're doing kind of backwards reasoning. So we're simplifying. You can think of it as simplifying the goal from this. You have to prove this to, to we only have to prove true. And the denotation of true is true, and that's pretty simple to prove. By the way, you guys are free to interrupt me or stop me at any point. Here, we build this proof term, which is you know, equally large to the previous term. But the nice thing is, is, as this formula gets larger, this proof term stays essentially the same size. The only thing that changes is this, is this term here and this term here, which tell you essentially which are the, the syntactic representation of the goal. So, if we add 100 more conjuncts here and 100 more conjuncts here, this term will get 100 larger and 100 larger and 100 larger and 100 larger, but we won't get the kind of exponential blow up that we saw in the previous, uh, in the, in the previous example. So let's, take a, let's dive a little bit deeper in, into this idea. So um, here we've defined our language props. We start by defining that syntax. We give a denotation function. We describe the meaning of what our terms mean. So here we're saying true is true, prop D of this, um, of this conjunction is just the conjunction. This is kind of like a standard denotational semantics. Then we write this procedure. So procedures, yeah? Is X sharp in that syntax? X sharp? Uh, think of this as the injection of something. So P, for example, and the sharp represents we're going to represent it as a number. Um, and that's because when we go to find this assumption here, so here we'll have something like P. You want to prove P. 
And you'll have an assumption that says, oh, I know p is true. But we can't check to see if two propositions are equal. We'll only be able to check, for example, that a, two numbers are equal. So we're going to use the fact that two numbers are equal to infer that these were actually the same proposition. So what's the type of x? Um, this x here, yeah. that's just a constructor. So that's the name of the constructor I'll use. Pre-intensial uh, terms. What you're saying is that you're set up, setting up a formal framework to be able to say that once I prove that arbitrary assertion P and Q, so actually uh, P and Q implies Q and P, basically this lemma can be uh, reused all over the place by plugging in concrete P and Q? Yes. But we'll be applying it usually to ground terms. So we'll, we'll apply this in our actual proof verification. We won't build, build a we won't build specialized lemmas for them. Just to uh, pick on Andy's question, it's the name of a constructor. Which constructor? Uh, which constructor? You can think of this as a three constructor type. Okay. True. Okay. So it's an arbitrary constructor that yeah. is in that type. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something that uh, systems like Lean would uh, automate using higher unification? Um, there's nothing necessarily higher order about this. You can just think of this as an uninterpreted predicate. So, um, just. Predicates. Sorry? Oh, okay. So let me not do it. Okay. Y yes. You can pattern match on this type. Um, and you'll be able to know, essentially, if you get this, you'll say, I don't know anything more. It's just some term that I don't understand. But wait, wait, what about the hash? I'm really confused here. That you you go x sub hash, and then over here you go x sub little p. Okay. So, so is 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 is, uh, is I don't know. Is, is it, you're saying it's a three constructor term. So that third guy, which is the constructor, the hash or the x? The x is the constructor. The hash, I'm just saying, this is a number. So, so it's sort of x of int. Is yes, x of int. Ah, okay. Sorry. And so over on the right, the little p is int. Yes. Okay. My apologies for that. Yeah. When we go to prove our procedure, our theorem looks something like this. So here we saw that goal above, or we're using the prove procedure, and we're applying it to goal. We're getting out some value true. And we says, if we get out true, then if we know all of the assumptions, that's what we're saying here, if all the assumptions are provable, then the goal is provable. Does this make sense? All right, so how does this pan out? We've said, OK, we can build better proof terms if we use computational reflection. So where can we apply computational reflection? It turns out that we can only apply it between individual um, proof goals here. So we can compress this large proof into a small proof, but we can't compress this large proof into a small proof. And the reason is because we took and we carved out the language of propositions into a little set here, this, this, um, this type here. When we needed to do arithmetic reasoning, we needed to carve out a different set. right? And these two sets are in some sense incompatible. When we get to an equality term in the logic framework, this will be used, we'll use this with x. But in, in the E framework, for a reasoning about arithmetic, we'll want to actually represent it as this equality. And vice versa, when we need a, to know about a conjunction of facts in E, we won't be able to represent it. We'll have to represent it using x. Does this make sense to people? So the problem is, is that I've carved out two different languages, and they don't know about each other. So the goal of the next few slides in the talk is to show you how we can actually put them together. And to do this, we're going to take our two, two representations of syntax here, our propositional language and our arithmetic language, and we're going to factor them through simple language you all might recognize, something like the lambda calculus. So here, the same thing, um, the same thing holds. So underlined blue terms are constructor names. Here, this at sign means application. So this is the application of E1 to E2. We've got lambda terms, and we've got bound variables. All right? Now we can take the common or the specialized parts of each of these languages. So here, logic is talking about the type prop, and it's using these 
these expressions, and and true, and the arithmetic language is talking about natural numbers and prop, and it's using these constructors plus and equals, and we can kind of use those. So these b's will, will, will be used as uh, the values in this e constructor, right? And the, and the t's up here will be used as the values to these constructors. So if we want to represent a hybrid term, true and e1 equals e2, we can use the injection of and from this language, the injection of true from this language, applied to the injection of equals from this language, and then e1 and e2, however they might be represented. Who have I lost? Yep. I would like to introduce a different uh, uh, background theory, say I would like to uh, throw in bit vectors. Yep. So, um, so, so there's some schematic approach to throwing new theories, or is it like very laborious for every new addition? Um, it is not trivial, but it is much easier than it used to be. And I will tell you how that works in just a minute. What two theories can I not put together? What two theories can you not put together? There are no two theories that you can't put together. Um, but there are slight limitations on how you phrase these things, which is what I'm about to talk about. All right. I mean, those two shared, say, prop in the, in the set of types. Yep. But who says that's really the same prop? And I mean, you could have a type that the two different theories really mm -hmm. treated as something different, even though it ended up with the same name. Sure. So, like, you assume some axioms of prop on one side and some other axioms, but each of them are by themselves consistent, but not altogether. Yeah, so then you'd have to use two different types. And the key thing to notice is that we're not going to, when you bake in those axioms, you'll write those axioms about prop, for example. And then the notion of prop in both of these cases will be the same. If you say, oh, I quantify over another type T, and I have assumed these axioms, T and prop aren't the same. Uh, the restriction to uh, non-dependent types inherent to the uh, uh, to what you're doing, or to yes. what you're doing. Yeah, we can't handle non-dependent types. Oh, sorry, we can't handle dependent types at the moment, and that's a limitation of the system. Uh, I mean, yeah, there, are, there have been several uh, reflections of cock in of Galena and cock. Uh, yes, uh, which handle the, them. So, yeah, um, so I think. This framework is a little bit, is geared more towards computational reflection as opposed to other, other ideas where you're talking about um, kind of just reasoning about cock in a meta theory way. Uh, wasn't, um, so Pierre's troop system was for uh, internalizing what cock MT does uh, using ref computational reflection. So it's a, pretty much on the, on, the, on the side of trying to prove stuff. So. Okay. Well, I, I'll chat with you offline about that. Thanks. All right. So we talked about the syntax. Let's talk a little bit about the denotation function. So some people were scared when I, used to sh when I showed this to them. So think about the prop D function. This is what we saw before. It was pretty simple. It turns out that the type language here is essentially exactly the same language. So here, we'll have an environment of types. You can ignore the zero, but that's a universe. Um, you have an environment of types, and you get a type, a syntactic type, and you return a type. So this is a denotation function for type. When we want to do the denotation for the, um, the, expression, uh, the, the expression language, we can think of it like this. Really, what's happened is we've put another language on top, this language of sorts, S. And sort has this very trivial denotation function because there's only one constructor, and it just always returns type 0. So if we wanted to expand this, we could say, oh, type D takes an environment, a type, and then a sort, and returns a value of type sort D. So here we're using dependent types to say the type, the return type of type D depends on its argument S sort. Okay, so using the same idea, 
we can talk about expanding this down and talk about the denotation of the term language. So we have our environment of types, which we'll need to feed to type D here. We have an environment of values that's going to represent these X constructors. We have an environment of variables for these bound variables. We'll have our expression, and then we'll have this dependent type. Here's, this is the type I expect out of this. So I can ask for the denotation of an expression at prop, or I can ask for it at nat, or I can ask for it at something else. And here, I use this maybe to note that not all terms have all types, right? So I might not get a value out. That's fine. All right. So we've built a new syntax that's extensible. We've built a denotation function for that. How can we start reasoning about it? So here, we have our old prove function. And here we've got our new prove function, where we've just basically said, oh, you know, we used to match on true. Now we need to match on this opaque symbol. And we need to figure out what index we want to say is going to be true. So there's going to be some index in our environment that means true. And there'll be some index in our environment that means and, and we'll stick that there. And this prover is only going to hold true for some environments. It's only going to hold when this, this question mark, say it's 0, actually represents true in the environment. So I can't universally quantify over TS and FS here. Right? In particular, this term isn't even well typed. Cock won't even allow you to state this because here the denotation function is taking this x question mark and the denotation function applied to that isn't the same as prop. They're not definitionally equal. Um, and this is a problem that we'll have to solve because we want to talk about our, our programs. So the idea is kind of simple. If you were going to do this, the most the simplest solution would just be, let's talk about what constraints the logic language needs. So let's just focus on logic for a minute. Let's say we require that prop is at position 0 in our, in our environment. So we can change our theorem to say, oh, you know, TC logic here, this guy, the constraints in that satisfy, or TS satisfies those constraints. So this is a way to say, I don't quantify over all environments. I only quantify over environments that satisfy these constraints. Now, this works great, and you would think it would be wonderful. We can substitute these guys in, but we still don't get a definitional equality here. We need to inject a cast that tells us, using this fact, I can prove that the denotation of x0 is actually prop. And it turns out that reasoning about this cast in an intentional type theory is a very difficult thing. right? So, how do we solve this? Take a step back. We'll think about an alternative formulation. So, we're going to talk about this function, apply C, which is going to take an arbitrary environment. Here, tau1, tau2, just represent arbitrary types. And when we apply some constraints to it, we're going to get out of a new environment that's the same as the old, except it must agree everywhere that logic makes, that this constraint makes a requirement here, prop, this will say the first index of this environment must be prop. So instead of stating that equationally, using an equation, we're going to state it by updating, essentially. You can think of this as updating the, the quantified environment. So here, instead of talking about TS and giving a constraint on it, we're going to construct a new environment, TS, updating this old TS prime here, and we're going to apply these constraints. Now, when you take the denotation function of x0 at the type level, you get prop definitionally, because our environment is actually prop cons on with some other things. So we don't have to worry about any casts. We don't have to worry about reasoning about any casts. We can do the exact same thing at the function level. So previously, we would have had to specify all of these terms with casts in them. But now, this term, which is a dependent pair, the syntactic type and the value of that syntactic type, this is well typed now, because the denotation of x0 is actually prop. And that's important, because true has type prop, and we need those things to match up. We don't have to cast anymore. So 
When we do this in the function side, we get the same property here. It looks exactly the same. And we end up being able to prove this theorem as opposed to not being able to prove this theorem, which will be important because we want to use it, obviously. All right. So semantic composition. How do you compose these theorems? If I wrote one theorem and then I wrote another theorem and I want to glue them together, how can I use both of them at the same time? So let's go back and think about our logic language, right? Prop here was required to be at position zero. In our arithmetic language, we required prop at position zero and numbers at position one. is really for this yeah. composition, right? I mean, the, the prop case is a very special one that you need in your generic Sanders theorem. You could have hardwired that in some other way, but when you want to combine theories, then you need the environments to match up, and that's really why you have yes. this uh, extension, the update mechanism to, to make things work. Yeah. yeah. In, in particular, over here, if we fix these environments in any way, then we'll, we won't be able to use it in an extensible way, right? So the key thing really is this slide where we're going to talk about how do we take this this proof that this logic prover is sound, and this proof that this arithmetic and this arithmetic prover is sound, how do we glue them together and use them both at the same time? Right? And the key thing to note is if we know we have constraints, we can talk about the composition of constraints. So just think of this operator here, circle plus, that computes a new set of constraints given an old set of constraints, or two old sets of, sets of constraints. And we can, you might notice. This circle plus is actually associ associative and commutative. All these nice properties hold of it. And that is going to be important for us. In particular, let's see, let's say this. So here, here we were, on the left, we were talking about apply C of this logic, uh, the constraints of this logic, right? So we can think about that here, apply C of the constraints of that logic. If we, sorry, think about it here. Apply C the constraints of this logic. So TC2 is logic here. TC1 is arithmetic. So if we take apply C TC arith and stick it in for TS prime here, and we do the reduction in cock, we'll note that we actually get out this term, prop N, and then this tail of the tail of TS, right? And that's exactly the same term we get out if we flip these two things. So when you partially apply, um, apply C to some constraints, and you do that, and you compose that with another partial application, if those constraints match up, then those two terms are definitionally equal in Cock. That means you don't have to reason about casts, and it means everything kind of falls out naturally. So if I stick apply C of TC arith in here, and if I stick apply C of TC logic in here, then these two terms have exactly the same types modulo the fact that here I'm talking about logic and here I'm talking about a rith. And so I can conclude that logic equals true and a rith equals true implies that both of these functions are true. Right? So I can use either one whenever I need it. The same holds for function environments. And the equivalent thing happens there. When I compose the type constraints, and when I can compose the function constraints, I get the specification of both of these, and all of these things are typed without casts. So what I've shown you so far is what lets you take these each individual provers and glue them together reflectively. So instead of justifying going into and out of each logic, each prover, now I get one step. And in particular, I can also have my logic prover call my arithmetic prover, and my, arithmetic, and my heap prover call my arithmetic prover in any way I want. So what I'm building is something like an SMT solver, where you've got all these communicating theories that can talk to each other. And the reason I can do that is because I don't have to go back down to, L, sorry, go back down to witnessing proof terms. That's important. So, you know, there's a few more things on this that I'm still doing with old proofs. It turns out that we can represent quantifiers, and it's not too difficult to see why. So I've got general purpose binders here, and I can convert general purpose binders into quantifiers just by using a function here, like x ex for the existential quantifier. This says interpret this next lambda abstraction as an existential, as, as an existentially quantified variable. 
Right? So there I can represent this term. There exists an x of type nat such that x equals 0. And in syntax, it's essentially represented like this. Right? So now I've been able to do reasoning about quantifiers and reasoning about heaps and logics and arithmetics and anything you might want in there. But there's one kind of nasty little bit in here, these maps. Now, I could write a prover about maps, but then I'd have to also write a prover about lists. I'd have to write a prover about every potential data structure that I might want to reason about. All my abstract data types, I'd have to write my own procedure to reason about them. And that's really annoying because we have a lot of them. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to derive these things automatically. I'm going to show you how you can build reflective procedures like auto or auto rewrite, which will allow you to build these guys from standard cock lemmas. Right, so if you've used cock before, you may think of, OK, I could write these theorems about cock, about objects like sets or maps, right? And I'd prove them, and I wouldn't know anything about reflection. And then I might want to use them in my reflective procedure. So it turns out that reflective procedures can't call LTAC. So you'd have to write a reflective procedure here, like prove, that would do a bunch of matching here, so in union here, would be implemented kind of by this first rule. You can prove this if you can prove this. And then you'd have to go and prove this theorem. And that would suck. Because every single collection of lemmas, you'd have to dump into this prover, and you have to write a proof about it. And we don't like writing proofs, despite the fact that we have formal verification. <laughs> so what can we do? We've got a very generic representation. It turns out that we can take this step, we can take these theorems, and we can construct hint databases. So just like you would use in something like auto or auto rewrite, those are based on hint databases, collections of lemmas along with their proofs. And we can build those objects syntactically and pair them with their proofs. Right? So now we've got this Galena term, which represents all of these lemmas. And so now you can get someone like me in my thesis to write this really annoying function autoprove which is the implementation of auto reflectively using this. And so as a user, you write these three theorems, you chuck them in a hint database, and then you say, Gregory, you worry about this. I'm going to call your auto prove. And whenever you want to use that, you use the auto sound, the soundness of that theorem. And you get generic reflective search for free. So you don't have to write your new your new decision procedure and prove it sound because I built a generic one and you can just instantiate it with the facts you care about. List of lemmas or something? Yeah. Okay. So all of this is Galena terms. So if you think of this as the, the syntactic representation paired with its actual proof object. What's driving the search? Proof search. So, is there some procedure that actually uh, enumerates candidates? Uh, so yes, this auto prove is does exactly what the auto tactic does in cock, which essentially looks at the goal, checks to see if it unifies with this term, and if it does, then it applies this lemma and tries to prove this. And this search, so how smart it is? Does it use backtracking or because it, it exhaustive blind? Does it learn something as from the failed attempts? It is relatively simple at the moment. Um, it could be smarter and it could be faster. So improving the performance here is, is, is feasible. Yeah, you can uh, ask that because you're, there's a, uh, a famous failure of, uh, of this type of automation in, uh, uh, in the project that was called R Omega, which was mm -hmm. reflective Omega and which ran much slower than actual Omega. Yep. Uh, because essentially interp running in, interpreted inside the theorem prover something that could run natively in, in the CAMEL uh, implementation is a, a very good idea. Yeah. So nowadays we use things like VM compute and when 8.5 comes out we'll use native compute. So that will essentially be compiling this cock term to assembly and running it on in x86. Data representations, which aren't the greatest. Uh, yes, this will be a, a this will be a question of how well can you do native compute? 
how, how well can native compute work? I think is the question there. Yeah. So probably the, the, this search procedure is something that Lean is implementing using this hardware unification engine. Yes. So we have to do unification to, to do this, right? Just like we've just been saying, in order to know when this theorem applies, we need to know when the goal unifies with this term, right? And so that's what we're talking about right here. So we have to solve this unification problem. If we think of the boxes here as representing question mark or meta variables, solving this unification says, what is the instantiation of those that will make these two terms equal? The difference, or as you pointed out, there's lots of things that we can do in this, but now unification is a cock term. It's a cock function that we can extend kind of in arbitrary ways. So cock has a built-in notion of unification, modulo, beta, eta, etc. We can make ours programmable and allow us to do things like unify x plus y with y plus x. Now people have pointed out that this quickly becomes a very undecidable problem. And if you notice, a lot of the things we've talked about thus far are undecidable problems in general. So you might say, well, maybe we don't want our reflective procedures to, to try to solve undecidable problems. But whenever you try to verify a program by dumping out a SMT formula and passing it off to something like Z3, you're not really probably guaranteeing that you're in a decidable theory. You might be, but often people will just say, well, I got this verification condition. Let me give it to Z3. Maybe Z3 will solve it. And often it does, right? So we're using the fact that Z3 is better than, it's able to solve things in undecidable domains, but not everything, obviously. So we're going to try to get lucky, and we, and we can use things like facts from the context or knowledge about things like plus to unify these things. And this gives us a, no, a, a nicer, cleaner notion of semantic unification that we, that we would like to use when we reason about kind of higher abstractions that Koch doesn't know about natively. Further, our unification is type directed. It turns out you need types in order to write this theorem or in order to write this and prove it nicely. But you can also add extra facts that depend on types. So we can unify any term of type net or of type unit with TT or any two terms of type unit with each other, just knowing the fact that the only value of type unit is TT. So using all of these things, we can put all of these things together reflectively. We've gone from the beginning to the end in one reflective procedure that we're going to call one time and get the whole proof out. And we'll be able to prove an entire goal like this uh, just using that one procedure. All right, so various questions have arisen throughout the talk. How do you handle dependent types and things like that? So we sit, the talk presented something like the, like the simply type lambda calculus down here. When you want to do various extensions of this, like polymorphism, you can do that in the framework. Um, right now, we don't do it in a completely generic way, but um, you can basically add um, type terms to each and say that each x sub question mark is actually like an ML typed term, or a type scheme. It has a type scheme. And you're required to instantiate the type scheme each time you want to use it. Right? So this isn't general polymorphism, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice um, for what for what you get in something like ML. You can also think about type functions, things like list, currently you monomorphize them, with things like um, universe polymorphism, things like that, then you can, you can build those into the system as well. Right? So that's enriching these different languages, the type language and the term language, with new constructors. Dependent types are a lot harder because you might say like, well, what I need is my term language to be indexed by my type language. My denotation function here needs to mention the denotation function above it. And so truly dependent types would require a cycle here. We can approximate that by building additional layers down. Right? So we can say, you can depend on things which don't depend on terms. You can depend on types whose types don't depend on terms. But you can't do three levels or four levels. If we can make this generic, then we can build this arbitrarily, 
arbitrary levels down and um, use that as a kind of an approximation. You think of this as the different levels of the universe hierarchy in some sense. So those are the three primary axes. Completing the lambda cube obviously depends on all of those things and putting them all together in the same system. So related work, there's been a lot of work. We've, we've, people have mentioned some of them. So we've got things like R omega and AAC tactics, things like ring and field. These are different reflective procedures which work on subsets of domains. So for example, R omega works on numbers, field and ring work on theories of fields and rings. They're specialized to work on those procedures. They're pretty good, but they don't compose well. So I can't take my reasoning in, um, uh, can't combine these two things in nice ways. If I want to re re reason about fields and rings of two different types and how they influence each other, I can't do that in one reflective procedure. I'll use LTAC to glue them together. We've got things like posterior simulation, which is about improving the performance by recording traces through reflective procedures, and that's complementary work to our own. Other systems like BerryML, New Perl, and logical frameworks like LF have different approaches to this type of automation. Um, computational reflection was, I believe, first done in New Perl a while ago. It's a little bit easier in that system and in these other systems, which are kind of built for reflection, because for example, new Perl is extensional. We never have to reason about casts. Casts are always free, or casts by equality proofs are always free, but they pay the price of undecidable type checking or carrying around proof terms, and also things like restrictions of reduction to you can't reduce un underneath binders or in open terms. Recent work, MTAC is a, um, is a new tactic language for COC. It's still a tactic language. It's still building proofs, and it still suffers from the same problems you get in LTAC, though it is a much nicer kind of formulation than LTAC. SS reflect is a similar notion. Both of these are extra logical, so they're building the proof terms, but they're a lot cleaner than kind of what you might think of as the LTAC solution now, where you might do things very manually. Right, so I'll conclude with, with kind of how I started. The system is all implemented in something called MirrorCore. It's available online, all in COC. Um, it has these three applications at the moment, and we're looking at extending it a little bit to um, address some of the complicated issues with um, the charge program logic and, and the C program logics that people are working on. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay. Peter? How dynamic is your framework? I mean, if you, say, formalize um, some fragment of intuitionistic logic, um, you've shown how it can be applied by interpreting your lowercase prop as um, Cox uppercase prop. But what if I want to interpret it in a different way as, say, heap predicates or something? Can I use the same provers for, for those? Yes. So that's, that's what you've done, I guess, with charge and so on. Yeah, so with charge, we've built essentially a Tato solver at the moment, so Tato is just tautologies. We've built it over an arbitrary logic. So you give it an instantiation of Jesper's I logic statement or a, an axiomatization of intuitionistic logic, and our prover will work over that. And can you mix so Could you mix different interpretations of the um, of, of prop say in the same system? In some places, you want to just use to auto with um, with an interpretation in prop, and in some other places you want to interpret it in a different... Yeah, so that would be two different instances of, of that prover. So applied, for example, at the prop type or applied at the nat arrow prop type or the heap arrow prop type. And so because you get kind of the same... Um, because you internalize all of that, you can apply it at different levels. You can, you can worry about injections of prop into for example, your heap arrow prop logic and things like that. So all, yes, all, all of that works out. So you mentioned this is a verified browser, so should we be compared to the choose this there with the quark browser? I'm sorry? A verified so browser. A, a quark thing from UCSD, so that's actually with quark verified kernel and then they prove cookie, security, secrecy, integrity, address bar, and all, all this stuff. 
sort of, in terms of, or at least simpler question, if you're not familiar with Quark, so what does your browser do and what have you proved about it? Um, so I haven't built a browser. We built a web server. Oh, good <laughs> um, so in that sense, we do the server and they do the client. So what can I tell you about the web server? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. So the so the web server. So we actually built two web servers. One one was in Why Not, and one was in in Bedrock. The Bedrock one is just a kind of a standard ground up um, web server. It uses cooperative multi-threading um, and features like that to serve essentially static web pages. And so what did you prove about it? Um, essentially, it's just proving memory safety. And so the web server was written in. The web server is written in bedrock. Oh. Whoa. I made it there. The web server is written in bedrock. So assemb essentially assembly language all the way down. It has a few axioms for send and receive network communication, but that's it. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. It's built on quite a few. It takes about 30, 35 minutes to compile. So. Uh, do you get subtypes or predicates for free? Or do you not get it at all? Subtypes of predicates? What type of thing do you mean there? I guess uh, so. Do you mean like propositional Im Im implication? Is that what you mean by yeah. subtypes here? Yeah. yeah, so you know, um, if you want to prove P is even and you have a proof that P is a multiple of four, for example, right? There P is even is a subtype, oh, sorry. Yeah, say P is even, P is four implies P is, a, P is even, or P is a multiple of four implies P is even. You can reason about that within the system. There's, there's no limitations in that regard. But you have to code it yourself. You don't get anything for free. But it's expressible for free. Yeah, it's accessible for free. So is it fair to say you're kind of like doing like Hall style reasoning in Cock, right? Where you haven't got any, I mean, think of the Hall theorem prover, right? Where you haven't gotten proof terms. Yep. And you're just trying to get away from the cost of that. But uh, what are you doing in addition? I guess you're kind of justifying the actual tactics. Yeah, so in a sense, yeah, Hall, Hall is built on this notion of we'll kind of use the type system of the meta language to justify like and use parametricity to say that we're not going to build any bad proof terms. Um, this is saying kind of something similar. We'll justify this this prover and then we won't have to build the proof term. We are technically building the proof term because if you took that soundness theorem and you said actually compute it down, there would be a proof term there. We're just saying you don't have to look inside of it. So um, if you didn't want to give away your fancy prover, you could imagine just opening up that proof and saying, compute it all down, get rid of my terms. It should go away, but it'd be ugly. Sometimes people are interested in, in counterexamples to theorems that actually do not hold. Is this something that you could produce? A counter? Or set up a framework for doing that? Something like nitpicking, is that? Yeah. Um, Say so this framework can do a lot of things. You have to do it yourself, though, right? So um, this framework could generate counterexamples. You could use this framework to build a representation of different theories. And you could ask, instead of for auto proof, to say um, return true if it's, true. If, it's, if it's provable, you could say return a model in which this is untrue, right? And uh, so you could do it, but because you're not really caring about the proof so much, it's probably not the best application for it. So I think that, you know, if you're looking at debugging theorem statements and things like that, um, things like SMT solvers much better at that. It'll it'll work nicer. It'll work very easily, like out of out out of the box. But if you're really interested in having that final piece of assurance all the way down, right? then something like that, either having something like Z3 produce proofs or 
building something like this that's verified, and so you can get that final foundational proof. That's where something like this is really useful. So, so, I, so I, I guess your motivation not, uh, to start off with was to, uh, to you know, to, to move move the work out of I guess LTAC into the, these these improvers, you know, for efficiency to make things go faster. Mm -hmm. um, so, so can you come up with any evidence that, that that's that's worked? You know, the proof's actually faster than if you had done it otherwise. Yeah. So I don't have a slide on performance, unfortunately. Um, so when we did when we did Bedrock, the, the first version of Bedrock was a simplified assembly language. And it was kind of fast enough in LTAC. When we moved to the new version of Bedrock, which is more realistic, it uses bit vectors and kind of more interesting instructions, things kind of fell apart instantly. So we were able to symbolically execute like up to three instructions at a time, right? This system will symbolically execute as many instructions as I've been able to give it instantly, right? So that's certainly a win. <laughs> um, Bedrock is currently architected in a way that it does reflective reasoning followed by some LTAC reasoning followed by more reflective reasoning. And going into and out of is where we pay most of the cost now. So the reason why the web server takes 30 minutes is because we actually go into and out of reflective procedures multiple times, you know, 15, 30 times every proof obligation. And so when you have a lot of proof obligations, it's a lot of going in and out. It's a lot of these theorems kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, so using something like the work here and moving more of those things reflectively, we think will drastically improve that. Using MTAC instead of, uh, of LTAC for doing that transition help, perhaps? Um, I don't believe that it would help. You're still building the proof term. Um, building the proof term. It's the atrocious performance of unification in COC that's probably killing you. It's having variable assignment be quadratic in the size of the context. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a, a more, like a better proof engineering of going into and out of reflective procedures would be helpful. Yeah. And it would cut down on some of that time. So apart from the performance issue, is there any reason why we shouldn't just throw away auto and torto and replace them with your reflective versions? Should, is that the future of COC? Um, I think it could be a future of cock. Auto and, and Tato and things like that will handle dependent types using higher, higher order unification. There are other issues in that when you're doing things reflectively, you have to be very, very precise about everything that you use. So for example, unification in cock is modulo delta reduction. So unfolding terms. I don't get that for free in my system because I'll just have this opaque term plus, and I'll have to know what plus equals. So if you define your own function, you almost have to hint to the system that says, my function actually has this body, right? And that is something that you're not gonna get reflectively. It's something that you could ask yourself, how could we do it reflectively? And I think there, are, there might be ways to do it, but you're still talking here about kind of increasing this trust a little bit. So yeah, you don't get things like delta reduction, but you do get, you know, plus reasoning, higher level plus reasoning that's programmable. Is there an issue of equality amongst the different theories? Yes. Could you run into if you so the different theories are somewhat user defined, I guess. Yeah. Um, they could have different notions of equality, I guess. Be handled um, they do have different. They could have different notions of equality. It will. It will show up in your proofs. For example, if you're reasoning about a setoid, say you're reasoning about a setoid in sets, right? The equality on sets is the set notion of equality, not Leibniz notion of equality necessarily. There, your prover would have to talk about. I. I like your. The proof of your. Prover 
would state, I prove Settoid equality for sets. I don't prove Leibniz equality. And it's up to you as the client, for example, to say, here I only need Settoid equality on sets. So I might need to say, the function that I'm passing this set to respects Settoid equality, and therefore I can use this procedure to reason about it. But if it doesn't respect Settoid equality, then I can't use that. And so that's where you're doing things like when you're reasoning about setoids or things like that, you have to reason about whether functions respect those setoids. Equality is just another predicate. It's, it has the same, you know, it's as specialized as cock is in some sense. You could replace all of the notions of equality here with a type directed equality that says like, oh, you know, functions preserve equalities and things like that, but it's not done in the system. All right. Thanks, Gregory. Thank you so much.